Well, good evening, good evening, good evening, my friends, and welcome to another edition. It's uh, last Wednesday of the month, almost the last day of the month, August 30th, 2023, uh, and welcome to another Wednesday night virtual Bible study with the New Hope Baptist Church. I'm your host, Pastor Harold Miller, Jr. Thank God for all of you who are sharing with us. And those of you who are live and those of you who will share this video uh, later on or view it later on, we thank God for all of you. Uh, we are praying tonight. We're just experiencing, as you probably know, a hurricane, uh, Adelia. And we're praying for uh, those uh, people who were involved with that. And so we just pray that uh, there'll be no casualties and that everybody is safe. Listen, uh, we were not with you last Wednesday. We were in revival and we thank God for um, Pastor J. Philip Baker and Reverend Timothy Williams uh, did a great job doing our revival. We thank God uh, and we thank them for allowing God to use them uh, to bring messages that were edif that edified the body of Christ. And if you'd like to uh, view those messages, they are on our Facebook page, the same medium in which you're viewing this now. Go in the video section, and I have a sermon there from uh, Tuesday night from Pastor uh, Baker, and from Wednesday night from uh, Minister Williams. Uh, had some technical difficulties the first night, and that's why we didn't do uh, a video for the first night. But nevertheless, we're back again for another uh, virtual Bible study. Tonight, we're going to be talking about uh, the devil is not in hell yet. We're going to be talking about the present location of Satan. The devil is not in hell yet. We're talking about the present location of Satan. I want to remind you now, as we always do, uh, that uh, we want to encourage you to share with us on tomorrow night from 8 p.m. until 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for our uh, call-in prayer line. That's the New Hope Baptist Church prayer line is every every Thursday night uh, comes on from we hear from 8 p.m. until 8 30 p.m. and that is Eastern Standard Time that's 8 p.m. until 8 30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and the number to call is 774-220-4000 uh, Again, that's 774-220-4020. Access code is 372-1137, followed by the pound sign. As we pray tonight, we're lifting up, as we said earlier, uh, there's so many disasters going on all over the world. Uh, and it's hard to keep up. We're still remembering our friends in Hawaii as they're dealing with the aftermath of that, of that dreadful fire. Just recently had a hurricane just this morning, touched down in Florida. So we're praying for the people of Florida. We're praying uh, for the violence that's all over our nation. There was a shooting in Jacksonville, uh, shooting in at, uh, the college in North Carolina, uh, at Chapel Hill, and I tell you, just so much going on, and so if there ever was a time when the people of God need to be praying, that time is right now, and on our own uh, front, we are praying for Sister Ruthie Petaway as she recovered from recent surgery, we're praying for uh, Sister Margaret Lackey, Sister Lackey is the uh, sister of our own Marjorie Duncan, Stays right down the street from the church. Uh, she's been having some health issues. I understand she's been in the hospital. Uh, I got a text 
from uh, her daughter today saying that she'd probably be coming home soon. And so we're praying for her. Also praying for uh, Sister Bunny Wilburn. I own Sister Bunny Wilburn. She's also going to have some issues. She's in the hospital, maybe coming home soon uh, today or tomorrow, I believe. And so we're lifting her up in our prayers. We're also praying for Sister Vicki Baines and uh, Sister uh, Theodosia Thomas. Speaking of that, also, we're also praying for um, our own brother Thomas, Sister Ernestine's husband, Linnell Thomas. And that was an, another brother Thomas who used to work with uh, Lester Lackey Funeral Home, I think it's Linton Thomas. He was funeralized today. And so a lot going on, a lot going on. But nevertheless, you know, some, so oftentimes we feel like we're overwhelmed with all that's going on. But uh, God sees all, he knows all, and he can handle it. He says in the word that we have to cast our cares upon him, for he cares for us. Interesting word, that word cast. He's not talking about just simply lay it on him, gingerly or gently. He says, cast it, throw it on me, throw it on me. Cast off your cares onto me. I can handle it. So let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight, and then we'll be going forth with our lesson. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for right now. We thank you for another opportunity to come uh, one more time in this virtual space. We pray, God, for those who are listening to this live, who are viewing live, and those who will view it later on, uh, that you will just meet them at their point of need according to their faith. And that some, oh God, who may not even have the faith, grant them your favor so that they may know that you are a gracious God. Father, we pray now you forgive us of our many sins, our sins of omission as well as our sins of commission. We pray, God, for those who are sick among us. We lift up Sister Bunny. We lift up uh, Sister Margaret. We lift up Sister Ruthie. We lift up Sister Vicki. We lift up Sister Theodosia. We lift up Brother Paul. We lift up Brother Nail. And we lift up all those families that stood around the graveside to bid a loved one goodbye. We lift up those people, oh God, who are still dealing with the recent tragedy in Hawaii. We lift up those who are even now dealing with the storm damage from the hurricane that just, just today passed through Florida. We pray for our neighbors down in Cuba who are also affected. Lord, if there was a time when we need you, we need you right now. Grant us your grace, grant us your mercy. And in this teaching moment, God, give us clarity of mind that we'll be able to understand, even articulate clearly what your word says so that your people might be blessed. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Well, God bless you. God bless you. Again, we're talking tonight about the devil is not in hell. The devil is not in hell. Uh, the present location of the devil. He's not in hell yet. He's not in hell yet. The present location of Satan or the present location of the devil. I remember when uh, I was small growing up in my mother's house, mother would often say, because there was so much evil in the world, and, and you know, that was, <laughs> we, we're talking about 
you know, 40, 50 years ago. And it is much worse now than it was then. But my mother would talk about the fact that there's so much evil in the world. And she would say, it's almost like the devil is walking around on earth. Of course, she said that because at that time, uh, and even today, uh, there was a common, I guess, traditional thought that somehow or another, the devil is in, in hell, stroking the fires and keeping watch over people who have been confined to hell. And so she said that it was almost like the devil was walking around on earth. That was her way of saying that evil is so personified on earth. It's like, you know, people are personally possessed by the devil. The devil is influencing people so much uh, to a certain degree. Uh, but, you know, when we look at the Bible, and one of the things I, I the main thing I try to do with this lesson, uh, these lessons, rather, that I present to you, and even with the um, thoughts I put on uh, Facebook, I, I want us to uh, look at the word, the Bible, uh, through unfiltered lens. So often we look at the Bible through the lenses of our tradition. In other words, when we when we sit down to read the biblical text, we always we already have some preconceived notions in our head, in our mind, as to what the text is saying, uh, and 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 we've been conditioned by our traditions, uh, things we've been taught in the past, and I'm suggesting that a lot of things that we've been taught, men that are in the Bible, are not that you know we were taught that we're in the Bible. Uh, were not necessary, are not necessary in the Bible. And so I'm challenging us uh, to allow the Bible to speak for itself. And if we do that, we will discover some amazing things. For instance, of all the biblical references about the devil, there is not one passage that depicts the devil as presently in hell. Think about it. And so where do we get the idea that the devil is in hell? <laughs> yeah, it, we get it from our tradition. It doesn't come from the Bible. Because there is not one biblical reference, not one passage of scripture, now, one passage that indicates that the devil is presently in hell. And so mama was right. Mama was right. It's not, but but it's not almost, you know, she said it's almost like, but it's really not. It's not almost like the devil is walking around. The devil is walking around on earth and so let's look at the question of what and where is hell because i think uh when we talk about hell again we need to allow the bible to be our reference and not our preconceived notions and not our traditions uh, when we think of hell, we think of hell as the place of fire and punishment. Uh, but the term that is most often translated as hell in the Bible refers to something and someplace different. Uh, there's a passage I have cited here in Psalms 9:17 as an example. There's, there's so many of them. But he says, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Now, in that particular passage, the Hebrew word 
And when I say Hebrew word, that automatically tells us we're talking about the Old Testament. Old Testament originally written in Hebrew, New Testament Greek. So the Hebrew word that is translated as, as hell into the English word hell in this verse and most all other Old Testament passages is the word Sheol, Sheol. And Sheol was not primarily a reference to a place of punishment, like we think of hell, but it was a reference to the underworld, the grave, or the world or the realm of the dead. So, so whenever you see the term hell in our English Bible, is not necessarily talking about what we commonly think of hell. Sometimes it could be a reference uh, merely to the grave. Sometimes it could be a reference to the uh, underworld, the realm of the dead, or the world of the dead. Is what I'm simply saying is that every time you see the word hell in the, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, don't just automatically assume it's talking about that place of fire and brimstone. Because a lot of times it's not. Jesus said this. He says, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out, cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Now, that word hell in the New Testament is uh, translated into, uh, in this particular text, is Gahina. Gahina. And uh, it was a reference to the burn pit uh, in the Valley of Hinnon. A uh, couple of the kings in their idolatrous practices sacrificed their children to gods in the valley of, Hen of Henan. And so the Jews, uh, uh, because of that, the Jews uh, regarded those that valley as being cursed. Uh, Gehenna also referred to the burn piles that were outside of the city of Jerusalem where they would uh, burn trash, refuse, and sometimes even uh, the bodies of the poor dead. So, and where sometimes dead animals were cast out and burned. And so Jesus says, you know, the, he, he's talking about a place of fire but the, the primary reference now, he, he's, he's paralleling, he's comparing that uh, to the city burn pit. So that's one word used in the New Testament that's translated as hell, Gehenna, Gehenna. Let's look at a familiar passage of scripture, uh, Matthew 16 and 18. Uh, Jesus goes to Caesarea Philippi. No, no I'm sorry, not Caesarea Philippi. He, go, he goes to, uh, uh, oh gosh, I'm having a brain freeze, but he's outside of Israel, he goes to this place that's uh, uh, at the foothood, foothills of Mount Hermon, foothills of Mount Hermon. Let me look that up right quick because I don't want to tell you wrong. Uh, that's Matthew 16, uh, verse 18. Yeah, I was right. It is, it is Caesar of Philippi. Okay, I was getting confused there for a second. Uh, now, this is just a side note. It has nothing really to do with this lesson per se. But as a side note, whenever you're reading your biblical text, 
and it gives you a location. It's a good idea to find out something about that location. In this particular text is a well-known passage where, you know, Jesus said, the bonus rock, I'll build my church. It gets hell. So it's a well-known passage, but I want to suggest to you that traditionally we have we misinterpreted what Jesus was talking about. And the reason why we misinterpreted what Jesus is talking about is because traditionally we have paid no attention to the geographical location in which he said. He didn't say it in Israel. He went, he purposely went to that location to make a statement. Caesarea Philippi. The location was the headquarters for the Greek god Pan. Uh, he Pan was a, 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 a Greek god who was had the body, upper part body of a man and feet like goats, like a goat. Half man, half goat. Okay. It was also, this location was also at the foot or in the hills of Mount Hermon. Hermon, according to Jewish tradition, Hebrew tradition, was the spot where the sons of God came down in the days of Noah. They came down to cohabitate with the daughters of men. Very significant spot. So here's my point. Why, 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 why am I bringing all of that up? Uh, because I think when Jesus said, there are Peter on this rock, I'll build my church, you know, uh, the Catholics say he was talking about talking about Peter. Therefore, they said Peter was the first pope. Protestants say he was talking about Peter's faith. Uh, but maybe, just maybe, he was talking about the very rock they were standing on. <laughs> because guess what? Where they were standing, the vicinity of where they were standing was literally called in that day and time the gates of hell. <laughs> it was literally called, he was standing literally at the gates of hell, the gates of the underworld. And hell was a reference not to, to where the devil, where, you know, people go uh, be punished, but to the un death. And so, in that particular verse, he doesn't, it, it really not hell, it's Hades. It's Hades. And Hades was the Greek equivalent to the Hebrew word Sheol. We just talked about Sheol. Remember? The realm of the dead. The underworld. The grave. So, whatever the person, and this is coming from Richard, uh, Bachham, uh, from the Anchor Yale Bible Dictionary, I agree. He says, whatever the precise meaning of Matthew 16 and 18, its reference must be not to the powers of evil, but to the powers of Hades to hold the dead in death. In other words, Jesus was saying, that I'm going to build my church and death won't be able to stop it. You know, because, you know, he less than, less than, in a very short time after he makes his statement, he goes up into the Mount Transfiguration, also in on Mount Harmon, reveals who he is in his glory. And very shortly after, he, he dies. Okay. So it seemed as if the gates of hell prevailed, but guess what? Early Sunday morning, God raised him from the dead. By extension, even when believers die, 
they don't stay dead for they will be resurrected. So I believe that's what Jesus was, was uh, 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 really alluding to in that passage. Now, I, I've got this called South Hell because, you know, hell is bad enough, regular hell. But, you know, you go to South Hell, that's, 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 that's worse. And it's interesting because in, in 2 Peter 2, 4, we read, and, and it says, For God did not spare, the, spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. Now, the interesting thing about that verse is that the Greek word that is translated as hell is not Hades, is not Gaina, but it is the word Tartarus. Tartarus, the only time it's found in the old in the whole New Testament, Tartarus. And the Greek referred to that as the place of punishment below Hades. In other words, this was solitary confinement. This, this, this was this was South Hell. Now, the angels that sinned is referring to the sons of God back in uh, Genesis chapter six. We read about the sons of God who cohabitated with the daughters of men. And they produce the Nephilim, the giants. Is those angels, they are the ones who are confined to Tartarus. Now, except for the story of the rich man and Lazarus, this is the only verse in the Bible that makes reference to someone in hell, really hell, hell, not the grave, but hell, hell. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's and they are confined in chains. These 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 guys were so wicked and evil that God did not even allow them their freedom. They are they were they are confined in chains from that time back in Noah's day. Even now they are confined in chains. Some some scholars believe that that uh, as Jesus prepares to come back in the days of Revelation. Uh, that uh, these uh, beings will be released uh, in the earth. So, these are angels, the angels that sin. Not the angels that followed Satan in his rebellion, but it's referring to those angels to those son of men, I mean sons of God, who cohabitated with human women. And that you'll find that in Genesis chapter 6, verse 1, immediately preceding the flood. And they are confined even now in Tartarus, below Hades, below, below. Uh, it's in the deepest, deepest solitary confinement of hell. So, hell, when? It's interesting, as I said earlier, the story of the rich man and Lazarus Jesus talked about the rich man being in torment, you know, after he died, the Bible said, you know, when Jesus tells a story, he says, uh, Lazarus died and the rich man died and in Hades, in Hades, he lifted up his eyes. So he depicts him as being in Hades immediately 
after death. But that is the only, only occurrence in the Bible where we have a picture of someone being in hell immediately after death. Uh, but most times, hell is always uh, presented as a future destination of the wicked. And so if we want to uh, uh, reconcile those, it, it may be that uh, where the rich man was was not his ultimate destination, but maybe maybe a temporary place until he he was consigned or will be consigned to his permanent abode. But consider these passages. Let's look at uh, uh, Matthew 13, 47 to 50. It says, again, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted out the good into containers, but threw away the bad. It says, so it will be, note the time, so it will be at the end of the age. So it will be at the end of the age. The angel will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them, that is the evil, into the fiery furnace in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is going to happen, Jesus says, at the end of the age. He says, he's talking to the Pharisees now. He says, you serpent, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Again, it's a future reference. He says here in Luke, he says, strive to enter through the narrow door. For men, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door saying, Lord, open to us. And then he will answer to you. I do not know where you come from. Then you'll begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. Now, this is a parallel to what he says in Matthew uh, when he said, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. He says, uh, I, I tell you, I don't know where you come from. Depart from me, all you that work evil. That's what he says in Luke. And in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourself cast out. And people will come from the east and west, from the north and south, and recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first, some are first who will be last. Talking about a future time at the end of the age. So, the Bible is clear that the devil is not presently in hell. The Bible is clear that the devil is not presently in hell. Well, why do we say this? Well, look at this passage here. This, this is a reference to Jesus' temptation. It says, Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness. And who met him in the wilderness? Jesus didn't go to hell. He was in the wilderness, and he was met in the wilderness by the devil. Now, some interesting parallels there. You got to know a little bit about Hebrew history and Israel history and and. Uh, how the Old Testament and the New Testament connects. In Jewish thought, the wilderness was the hump or the domain or the uh, or the place where evil resides. Uh, on the Day of Atonement, they sent out a goat into the wilderness, the uninhabited place, the wild. And they thought, it was believed that that's where evil spirits were. That's where evil dwelt, in the wilderness. Okay, so that's significant that Jesus goes out 
and he he's led by the spirit mark says he's driven by the spirit into the wilderness and there he's confronted by the devil not in hell in the wilderness and of course as first peter chapter 5 verse 8 he says he he tells us the author tells us be sober be vigilant because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour he's walking about my mother was correct the devil's walking around on earth he's walking about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour so in jewish and early christian thought satan was not located in the underworld but rather in the lower heavens you know that's why that's why uh uh we read about paul talking about in in, in ephesians uh about uh evil in the heavenlies he's talking about the the atmosphere the spiritual arena the spiritual realm that's 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 in close proximity to earth now here's some other biblical hints of the devil's present location and first i mean in second uh uh second corinthians 4 4 he's called the god of this world or the god of this age uh, the word for uh the hebrew the greek word for a world in that particular verse is aeon is really the god of this age that's what paul says if our gospel be hidden it is hidden to them who are lost whom the god of this age has blinded their minds so he, he he's the god of this age he's 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 presently in the world working to blind the minds of unbelievers and this is why when you're witnessing to people when you're trying to present the gospel to people it's not a matter of them just seeing it with the intellect it's not just a matter of them you know being logical about it you have to understand the spiritual dynamic of what's going on satan is and the devil is actively working to blind their eyes or blind their minds rather so that they may not see and so what we have to do as we witness as we preach as we teach we have to pray we need to pray that god will open their minds that they may be receptive to his word because there's a spiritual dynamic going on uh, he's called in ephesians chapter 2 verse 2 the prince of the power of the air the prince of the power of the air jesus calls him this is jesus jesus calls him in john uh, 12 31 14 30 and 16 11 he calls him the ruler of this world the ruler of this world this cosmos this world system first john says the whole world lies in the within the power of the evil one we have to understand that as believers we are operating in enemy territory the world is automatically bent toward evil and away from good that this is why uh even as 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 children if you ever notice for with a child uh you don't have to teach them how to do wrong but you have to teach them how to do right even as a child they instinctively know when they're doing wrong i mean you know you know you tell them to stop doing something and when they think no way to look at them they'll look around you know try to make sure no i see them and they'll do it see that's 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 the way the world is then of course we just talked about uh that text in first peter where 
he walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour as an angel as a as a lion on the prowl and then then look at a, a revelation 12 12 we're going to go back to that, that passage in a few minutes because that's a very uh, significant passage for our discussion but just to touch on it briefly uh revelation 12 12 says uh for this reason rejoice o ye o heavens and you who dwell in them woe to the earth and the sea because the devil has come down to you having great wrath knowing that he only has that he has he has only a short time and so all these passages are pointing to the fact that the devil is on earth he's not in hell not now he's on earth this is where he's operating on earth now how did he get here well this is this is what we're going to talk about now this passage in uh revelation 12 3 through 9 and we're going to skip down to 12 and 13. It says, and another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and ten diadems on his head. His tail drew, drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them down to earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour the, her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne then the woman fled into the wilderness where she was where she has a place prepared by god that they should free they should feed her there 1260 days and war broke out in heaven michael and his angels fought with the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought and they did not prevail nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer so the great dragon was cast out that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceived the whole world. He was cast where? To the earth. And his angels were cast out, uh, cast out with him. Therefore rejoice, O heaven, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. I just read that. Now, when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Let me just say something about this passage, because uh, some have used this passage, and they say it depicts a, uh, you know, how the devil was cast out of heaven before the dawning of time. He took a third of the angels with it. Well, let's let the Bible speak for itself. Because when you read the Bible in context, you're not going to find a passage anywhere where it says that the devil was cast out and he took a third of the angels with him before the dawning of time. Because when you read this passage, first of all, this is the only passage where it talks about the devil being cast out. Only time it talks about a third uh, he said something about the tail sweeping them when the third was cast down to earth. It, it may be, you know, that the third didn't join him, but he he defeated a third. You know, if you read in context, it may be that. But here's my point. Here's why this is not a picture of a pre idemic fall of the devil. Or this is not a picture of the devil being cast out of heaven before Adam. Look at the look at the text. Talks about a, a woman about to give birth to a child. This, my friend, is what occurred immediately preceding the birth of Jesus. This is about the birth of Jesus. It's not about a pre adamic rebellion. It's about the birth of Jesus. That's the time. 
That's the time. That's the time. Not about the birth of Jesus. I mean, not about pre a pre pandemic fall or cast out, but it's about the birth of Jesus. Notice what it says, uh, 4 and 6. Uh, 5 says she, she gave birth to a son, the Messiah, a male child, the Messiah, who's ruler of all the nations. Her child was caught up to God. Woman fled into the wilderness. See? It's not before humanity was created. This is before the birth of Jesus. But now the reason why I brought us here is because of this. Notice the devil and his angels were not cast into hell, but were cast down to earth. That's a very important point. They were cast out of heaven but they were not cast into hell. They were cast down to the earth. The text also says his, his, his wrath is great because he knows he has but a short time. The point I'm trying to drive to you is that the location of Satan, the location of the devil at this time is not in hell but he's on earth. Now, the devil was in Eden when, when we um, find Adam. He, he, he's, he's using, and by the way, the serpent, that was not a regular snake. Uh, when, when the Hebrews and when the ancient people talked about a serpent, they were talking not necessarily about the snake that we know as a snake, but it was an indication that it was an angelic or a divine creature. But here's an interesting text. Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 15 through 12 through 15. He says, son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardis, topaz, and diamond, beryl, ox, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your tim timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed chair who covers you? Stab, I establish you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. Now, obviously, he is not talking about the human king of Tyre because the human king of Tyre was not in Eden nor was he the anointed cherub nor was he perfect in his ways from the day he was created this is a lamentation of or uh, for the devil now you might be asking as an aside and I think this is something that uh, 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 we don't think about. What's, what happens a lot of times, the reason why we come up with such incoherent um, thoughts as far as our theology is concerned is that we don't think our theology through. And I'm challenging you to think. Man, humanity, was created with free will. But I want to suggest to you 
that the spiritual beings God created, the angels, the cherubs, the inhabitants of the spiritual world, were created with free will as well. The devil made a choice to become the devil. In, in other words, when God created him, he did not create him evil. He became evil as a result of his choosing to rebel against God. There it is right here in the text. He says, you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created. In other words, when you were created, you were created perfect. There was nothing wrong with you when I created you. But iniquity, he says, till iniquity was found in you. So that tells us that even the spiritual beings, the angels, uh, the sons of God, all the spiritual beings that, that comprise the heavenly realm, the spiritual realm, they too were created by God with free will. The devil was not created as a devil. He was created uh, to serve God, and he chose another passage where he, he's filled with prayer. I'll be like the most high. I'll do this. I'll, I, 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 I. I believe that's in Isaiah. So that's a, that's a very important point I have to remember. Because God did, God, even with, even with the spiritual world or the spiritual beings, God did not create robots. God did not create any being pre-programmed with no freedom of choice. Now, uh, let's look at the devil's eternal resident. This is where he's going to end up. This is where he's going to end up. And this is in Revelation 20, verses 1 through 15. John says, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit. At some point in time, Though he's roaming the earth now freely, he will be bound and cast into the pit. Shut him up, set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years are finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. And I saw thrones and they that sat on them and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been, hit, had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast, nor his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. Apparently what he's saying is going to be a thousand years uh, between the first resurrection and the second resurrection. He says, because he said, this is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection, over which the second death has no power. For they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now, when a thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle whose number is as the sand of the sea. And they went out on the breath of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, Jerusalem. And the fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Here it is. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. 
you read earlier, the beast and the false prophet are cast into the into the lake of fire earlier. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death in Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That's a lot of stuff in here. I'm not going to go over it all. But just a few points to just what I wanted to lift for our consideration. Uh, the Bible, we, we have it right here in this passage. This idea of a general resurrection is not taught in the Bible or a general judgment. In fact, I, I did some teaching on this several years ago. The Bible talks about seven different judgments, seven different judgments. Now, here's the thing. As a believer, uh, you know, it, it talks about believers being, I think it's in uh, Corinthians, where ta Paul talks about believers being judged at the judgment seat of Christ. And he talks about hay, wood, and stubble, silver, and precious stone. This judgment will not be to determine whether or not the person goes to heaven or hell, but it will be to determine their rewards. Just as there are going to be degrees of rewards, there are going to be degrees of punishment. Everybody's not going to be punished the same. Everybody's not going to be rewarded the same. We're going to be rewarded. Now listen, salvation is by grace. That's not about ourselves, faith and grace. But there are degrees of rewards. The Bible teaches that. Now, that judgment takes place at the first resurrection. Okay? At the first resurrection. But here in this text, this is the great white throne judgment. Another judgment at a different place at a different time. In fact, it's a thousand years later. Everybody who's judged at the first resurrection are saved. That judgment is to determine the quality of their works. It's not to determine whether they saw, saved the lost. That's that's determined before you die. Sin was judged on the cross. In this judgment of our text, they're not going to be judged to determine whether or not they're good or bad. They're all bad. But they're going to be judged to determine their degree of punishment. See, murderers and all these thieves and crooks and people who kill all these folk, they're going to be they're going to be judged and they're going to be punished more severely than people who you know didn't really do anything. the The crazy thing about it, well, not the crazy thing about it, but the sad thing about it really is that. Uh, you don't have to be bad uh, to not go to heaven. All you need to do is just not accept Jesus. There are going to be some people who did good things in this world, but they failed to accept what God did for them at the cross. They fail to accept God's pardon through Jesus Christ. And so while they may they'll they'll miss and go go to the to the lake of fire, uh, 
their judgment will not be as harsh as some others. That's what this judgment is about. But notice now who all is in the lake of fire. The devil's there. The devil and his angels. The false prophet. The beast. And those who are lost. That, my friend, will be the final abode of the devil. That's literally the hell where he will be. The lake of fire. Note that death is personified. Hades is personified. The grave and the realm of dead. They will be cast into the lake of fire. And my friend, we don't, you know, we're living in a time now where, where people don't, don't believe in hell. Uh, but I heard a preacher saying some time ago, uh, just because you don't believe in hell, don't, that, that's not going to keep you from going. You may not believe you, you not you may not believe in in sickness, but that don't, that won't keep you from getting sick. So you not believing in something that's that's neither here nor there. That's not that 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 that, that doesn't change anything. But praise God, we have a gracious God who has provided a way for us. Through his son, Jesus Christ. That's the good news. The good news is, although we all deserve the wrath of God, we can escape God's wrath through his son, Jesus Christ. That's why he came to destroy the works of the devil. And so as we conclude tonight, in his book, and I highly recommend this book, Demons, What the Bible Really Says About the Power of the Darkness, the late Michael Heiser wrote, much of what Christians think they know about Satan, demons, and other evil powers, is guided by Christian tradition in hearsay than exegesis of scripture in his own context. In other words, much of what we think we know don't come from the Bible. Or some of it comes from misinterpretations or misreadings of the Bible. Uh, for instance, you know, there there is this uh this common belief that angels have wings. But if you look at the scripture, you're not going to find anywhere where angels have wings. It's not in there. The only, the only, the only spiritual beings who have wings in the Bible are the cherubs and the seraphs. And they're not regular angels. They're not, they, they are, they are thrones of the guardian, guardian thrones. Throne guardians, I'm sorry. And the Bible says, be careful, you may be uh, entertaining angels unaware. Well, I mean, if they got wings, you know they're angels. But every time an angel is depicted in the Bible, they, they look like regular men. But where we get that from? We get it from uh, uh, ancient literature, Dante's Tower Inferno, wherever but it doesn't come from the Bible. And so what I'm saying is a lot of stuff that we have adopted as doctrine, some of the stuff we've adopted as doctrine is not really doctrine, it's just tradition, not biblically based. But hopefully this brief overview will, will spark some, some a thirst to learn what the Bible really says about the devil, his location, how he operates. This tonight was just a brief overview 
we just scratched the surface. And so my mother was right. More so than she knew. The devil is indeed walking around on earth. And you know, it's not just the devil. There are other evil entities. Because you know, the devil is not omniscient. He's not every, he doesn't know everything. He's not, he's not omnipresent. He's not everywhere at the same time. There are other evil entities. There are ranks in in the in the uh, just as there are ranks in the righteous spiritual world, there are ranks in the evil spiritual world. Paul talks about powers and principalities. And so we need to be aware of this. Not consume, not obsess but aware because i believe a lot of what's going on now you know people talk about mental illness and yes mental illness is true there is mental illness but a lot of this is not just mental illness a lot of it is just plain evil and it's the work of the devil so we need to know how he operates and understand that he's not in hell barking up orders to his little minions. He's walking to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. If you're not diligent, my friend, you can easily become a victim. Well, God bless you. I hope this uh, has been a blessing to you. As I always say every week, if it has been a blessing to you, it'll be a blessing to someone else. And so I uh, encourage you, my friend, to share this video on your timeline. Because if it has been a blessing to you, it'll be a blessing to someone else. Well, that's all for tonight. I hope you uh, call in tomorrow night for our prayer line. Until the next time, may the Lord bless you real good is our prayer.